Welcome to Gut Talk TV by DAB, a YouTube channel focused on closing the communication and knowledge gaps in gut health. Please see our disclaimer below and press the subscribe button. Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Jake Begun. Hello, I'm Dr. Yunan. We are the gastroenterologists from Australia. And today we've invited Dr. Paul Clark with us to talk about fatty liver disease, uh, what it is and what causes it. So, Paul, um, a lot of people have a question about fatty liver disease and they're not sure what it is exactly and um, how common is it in the community? Uh, fatty liver disease is very common. It's the most common cause for abnormal liver tests, at least in our community and most Western communities for that matter. Um, its prevalence, it is so prevalent because of the prevalence of obesity uh, mm -hmm. in the community and all the metabolic problems that go with obesity like diabetes, hypertension, cholesterol problems. So really, for most people with fatty liver disease, it's a metabolic problem um, mm -hmm. that comes from obesity. Mm -hmm. hmm. And you mentioned uh, some of the terms that we can call fatty yeah. liver disease. Yeah, so I guess the lay term would be fatty liver disease, but we, we talk about non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Mm -hmm. Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is probably the most precise term that covers all sorts of underlying um, sort of subtypes major subtype being non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. Um, fatty liver disease is really a process where fat gets absorbed or deposited in the liver, usually in most people because of too much carbohydrate, too, many, too much energy in, not enough energy out. And, uh, and the liver gets, uh, is the way station of glucose metabolism and fatty acid metabolism. And so the liver gets uh, overwhelmed or deposited with, with fat and is, uh, is a relative block in the way that that's then further distributed. So um, that broad uh, brush term of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease includes non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, which is an inflammatory response to that fat when it gets absorbed. Sometimes in some people, there's an aggressive response by the immune system that leads to uh, injury and inflammation around the liver, and that injury can then lead to fibrosis and eventually to cirrhosis of the liver in some people. That's called non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, or you might hear the term NASH. And that's a subgroup of NAFLD. And most people in, in the NAFLD world have what we call bland steatosis or fat in the liver, and not necessarily terribly abnormal tests, but people with NASH actually have an, uh, an immune response to the fat. Mm -hmm. Important subgroup. And what are the risk factors of having this fatty liver disease? Do you have to be actually be fat in terms of obese in order to get this? It's, it's, uh, it's probably best thought of as a metabolic problem. For the vast majority of people, it it's, occurs in the context of a metabolic syndrome. Okay. And that's certainly the predominant sort of phenotype of fatty liver disease in the West. The metabolic syndrome is a syndrome associated with obesity. Um, and it's usually it requires a diagnosis of one or two things in addition to obesity, including hypertension, dyslipidemia, or um, diabetes. Often we don't get all the boxes ticked. It might be impaired fasting glucose rather than diabetes. Uh, it might be a, a overweight rather than obese in terms of the metabolic syndrome is quite fixed in its diagnosis, but in terms of the risks for fatty liver disease, it could be a, a sort of pastiche of different elements of that metabolic risk profile. That's really the most common um, cause, I guess, the most common presenting um, bunch of uh, features that a patient with fatty liver disease will have. Mm -hmm. And usually if you look hard enough, when you see a patient with fatty liver disease, you usually find some hint of risk um, that's apparent in a patient. Mm -hmm. You usually have to look hard uh, yeah. to find it. You used to do the tests, you know, sometimes you have to do an oral glucose tolerance test to try to find the, the impaired fasting glucose or, or you need to sort of track back in the history to find out what the patient's weight was when they were younger, uh, pre-pregnant for a what for a woman, a uh, 16 year old for a, for a young man, you know, try and work out what they were and, and what the patient is now and, and really get a bit, bit better sense of their personal risk profile for metabolic disease. Mm -hmm. I think we have a picture in our mind as gastroenterologists about someone with metabolic syndrome, but among our Asian patients who often have other causes of liver disease as well, uh, sometimes it's a different phenotype that we see. Yeah, it's interesting and, and there's an evolving literature uh, with respect to fatty liver disease in Asian patients. Um, um, I have a, a large cohort of um, patients from, with Asian backgrounds, and we see them frequently because of screening for hepatitis, liver cancer screening for hepatitis uh, B. And it's very common to see uh, fatty infiltration in the liver. It's, um, 
it does seem to be that with a more benign metabolic risk profile, that patients will have fatty infiltration of the liver, at least on the ultrasound. Mm -hmm. and it's not always clear exactly prognostically how important that is. Um, there's this concept of what we call lean NASH, NASH being that fat inflammation, inflammatory fatty liver. Mm -hmm. uh, lean NASH is where we don't feel strongly that there's a, a great uh, metabolic risk factor profile. That would seem to be at least anecdotally more common amongst Asian patients compared to Western patients. They would seem to develop fatty infiltration on ultrasound at least without the same sort of context of metabolic risk that I see in, in mm -hmm. Western patients. Um, and there's probably genetic features for that and, and other things that we might explain. It's important, I think, important for point uh, for people who might be assessing patients with fatty liver disease of whatever background mm -hmm. that we arrive at that diagnosis by by looking, making sure we're not missing anything else out as well. Yeah. So in the workup, I don't, should I talk about workup here? <laughs> um, maybe the patient might be also interested in, is there a symptom they should be expecting? Okay, um, yeah. Um, well, the most common symptom for fatty liver disease is no symptom. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's important as well. That doesn't mean that it's not a problem. It just means that there's no symptoms. There's very little that gives you symptoms in the liver. You can get a gallstone, that'll give you symptoms. Or if the liver gets big and starts stretching, that'll give you symptoms. So it's really hard to get a symptom out of, uh, out of, out of the liver, which is important for Asian patients with chronic hepatitis B who may not know they've got it as well. Um, so uh, if there are symptoms, then uh, usually it's from engorgement of the liver, that liver getting enlarged. We call that hepatomegaly, so an enlarged liver. Um, and that could be mechanical sounding pain when patients bend or twist. And woman putting up the washing, or a man putting up the washing, um, and bending over it, getting things out of a drawer, lying in bed at night. Those sort of symptoms are very mechanical sounding symptom. Uh -huh. um, other than that, really there's very little in the way of symptoms from the fatty liver disease itself, more from the things that might go with it, like the diabetes if it's poorly controlled, uh, sort of fatigue from being overweight and not fit, those sort of things, rather than the fatty liver disease. We really only run into pure liver symptoms later on when we're worried about a damaged liver, a cirrhotic liver, and that's where we often run into the pointy end, uh, the, the symptomatic end of liver disease. So great, we've talked all, all about what fatty liver disease is. We've talked a little bit about the risk factors in terms of metabolic syndrome, diabetes, etc. A lot of this disease is diagnosed in the community by GPs, the vast majority of it. So how is the diagnosis usually made? Yeah, well typically uh, patients will actually have it made inadvertently, really. Uh, um, that small uh, proportion of patients who come in with symptoms aside, most patients might be getting their liver test done for another reason. Uh, sometimes they'll get an ultrasound to follow that up and really the two kind of first steps of diagnosis would be abnormal liver function tests and usually an ultrasound that is suggestive of fatty liver disease. It's important to say that neither of those things are actually terribly sensitive or specific for fatty liver disease. So uh, patients can have normal liver tests and yet can have more progressive phenotypes and end up with cirrhosis. Some patients can have uh, no fat on the ultrasound. The sensitivity of ultrasound for fatty liver disease is probably about 70%, so it's not a perfect test. Mm -hmm. But that's, yes, that's the most common. Abnormal liver function tests, uh, when I talk about liver function tests, I actually talk about the enzymes. So the, the enzymes inside the liver, they can be raised when there's liver cell injury uh, and, and then an ultrasound that shows a fatty change to the liver. Mm -hmm. That would usually then prompt the GP to refer it on mm. or do more tests. Mm -hmm. So if you have those risk factors, as Paul has mentioned, or if you have a symptom such as you know stretching, feeling the, the pain, um, you can see your doctors regarding this. Um, but I hope you find this resource useful so far. But we'll have another video on um, living with NASH, so how to manage and talk about the prognosis. Um, please uh, leave any questions below and we'll try to address that.